Okay, great. So we're going to go ahead and get started um, with Bea. Yay. Yay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I think the meeting is going fantastic beyond my wildest dreams, so thank you. So now I'm going to ask you to um, shift gears once again, and now we're going to talk about basic cognition. And I want to take this opportunity that when we talk about developmental cognitive neuroscience, it's not just about basic cognitive mechanisms, which is what I'm going to talk about now, but it's also meant to be inclusive of social and effective processes as well. But right now, we're going to talk about cognition per se. So specifically, as you know, my laboratory uh, has had a line, a, a direction of study that is focused on voluntary response suppression. So the ability to suppress compelling suboptimal responses in favor of a goal-directed response. And as many of you know, we use the anti saccade task. I know that a lot of you have seen it, but I'll, for those of you who have not seen it, look at me because Doug is also going to be talking about this task again. So it goes like this very briefly. Look at a center target. Somewhere another light will appear. Don't look at it. Look the other way, and it should go like this. However, when you commit errors, this is what occurs. Oh, shoot, and you look the other way. And this is very important, you'll see, because we will also be talking about errors. And this is a, a particularly good model to look at cognitive control because we know it's neurocircuitry in the animal literature. We know it's neurocircuitry from fMRI studies in adults. And it is particularly sensitive to the adolescent period, meaning that although children, even models of infants, uh, and certainly adolescents, they can all do this uh, task correctly on a trial basis, but the rate is what improves with age. And this is a recurrent theme, so keep that in mind. So first, a little bit about our fMRI bold responses, and then I'm going to tell you about our MEG responses. So um, we've done several you know, studies that I'm sure some of you have seen in the literature looking at cross-sectional data. I'm going to tell you very briefly a little bit about our fMRI results. This is a paper that we've already sent the response to reviewers, so hopefully it'll be out uh, sooner than later. So what we did here is that we looked at 139 8 to 28 years old, uh, and it, it is a cross-sectional uh, uh, longitudinal study, meaning that we had a range of ages that came on, uh, on year one, and then subsequently we followed them up to six visits coming once yearly. And then because of the amount of data, and, so, and also because we wanted to be hypothesis driven, we chose our, a priori, our, our regions of interest in an a priori fashion. We selected the circuitry that we know supports the motor control aspects of the anti saccade task. We also selected to look at executive regions, and finally to also look at the error monitoring region of the dorsal arterior, anterior cingulate cortex. And we applied hierarchical linear modeling so we could test model shapes, estimate individual trajectories, and test for intercept and slope variability. By the way, th this is a study that uh, was Sarah Ordaz's dissertation. She's here. Say hello. And, uh, and if you have detailed questions, you can always ask her as well. So first of all, here's the behavioral data. We were able to, is there feedback? No. We were able to replicate our cross-sectional data, but also the cross-sectional data from several, from several laboratories, including that of Doug Munoz, uh, from this incredibly strong finding that anti saccade performance dramatically improves from childhood to adolescence and then continues to improve into young adulthood. What we were able to characterize with the longitudinal design was the nature of the variability. And what we found was that there was some rank order stability, meaning the performance at a given age varies, but the process of development does not change. When we looked at the bold response, we found that when we looked at the motor control regions, so regions like the FEF and putamen and so forth, we found that there were no, no age-related effects, except when we looked at variability, where we found that initially there's a lot of variability, but with maturation, there is less and less variability of the motor control regions. 
Then we looked at the executive control regions, at ventrolateral and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And what we found there was a robust association with age. However, what we found was that the growth pattern occurred from childhood to adolescence, so that by adolescence, the decrease in the need to use prefrontal cortex had reached adult levels, so keep that in mind. And also keep in mind from the, from the previous slide that frontal eye field activity was also equivalent in adolescence. You'll see that it all makes sense. When we found the most dramatic age-related associations was in the activity of the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. We found that with age, there was dramatic increases in the recruitment of this region during the error, the corrected error trials. And this was the only region that showed a clear and significant association with age, and I mean, with uh, behavior. Even after we controlled for age, we found that the more that you use ACC, the better that you're able to inhibit the psychotic responses. So in conclusion for this study, we found that executive prefrontal cortical systems appear mature by adolescence. This also includes the frontal eye field. And that increasing engagement of the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex may play a pivotal role in the development of voluntary response suppression. However, I want you to take a moment and realize that despite mature prefrontal cortical and FEF bold responses, adolescents still generate a lower rate of correct suppression trials. This is a mystery. What is underlying the fact that even though they can do a correct response, their rate of response is lower? And this, this becomes an important question because it might be reflecting the fact that lack of age-related differences in the bold response may not mean that the neural processes underlying them are the same. And you'll see that Brad Schlager will discuss this when he talks, when he gives his talk tomorrow. So we wanted to pursue the following question. Do neurodynamics associated with inhibitory control change from adolescence to adulthood? Now remember, bold response was equivalent. So we moved into MEG, and this is work that is spearheaded by Dr. Kai Huang, who is a postdoc now. He has a very elegant poster that you can go and look at more details as to this study. But he, um, he was underwhelmed uh, by the temporal resolution in, in, in fMRI bold, and he demanded that we go to MEG, so we did. Um, and the reason that we did was because MEG is very, very sensitive. It has incredibly high temporal resolution. It actually measures changes in magnetic fields resulting from electrical current generated by synchronized neural activity in the brain. It, as such, it is a more direct measure of neural activity. And importantly, you are really able to identify a particular, a, a particular aspect of a task in a way that you cannot do with fMRI. And this becomes very relevant when looking at the anti because of the work that Stefan Everling and Doug Munoz have done, identifying that the preparatory period of this task, when you're just looking at the instruction and making no responses, that can determine if you will be able to inhibit your psychotic response. So if you have a certain level of attenuation, you will be, you will be successful. If that attenuation is too high, you can predict that you will make a, an incorrect response in the non-human primate at the single cell level. So MEG is actually, can can um, tell us about mechanisms. So um, I'm going to speed up a little bit because um, I want my talk to be a little bit shorter. So for example, we can look at uh, frequency bands. And if we find beta power band in, um, in, in aspects of our task, this is telling us about top-down modulation. This is very important. This has been found in single cell work in monkeys that this is actually the case. When we find alpha power band activity, this is reflective of functional inhibition. This has also been found in monkey models, but also in intracranial recordings in humans. And we also have the ability to look at connectivity by looking at phase synchrony and power correlations. So we looked at 20 adults and 17 adolescents. 
We had them perform blocks of anti saccad tasks and blocks of pro uh, uh trials. That means just look at the light. Do not try to avoid it. And we used a very nice MEG system that we have at Pitt and with all the typical uh, ways that you're supposed to use it. We only looked at correct trials and we made sure that there was an equivalent number of trials across participants and conditions. The behavioral results are as we expected. Adolescents do not do well in the anti saccade task. And also that was true in the MEG environment. Here I'm showing you the spatial temporal evoked activity, which is distinct from the oscillatory results, which I will show you after this. But just to show you that as expected, we saw a posterior to frontal engagement uh, that was evident during the preparatory period, but also during the response period. But as I told you before, we were focused on what is occurring to, during the preparatory period. Remember, they're doing nothing but looking at a cross is telling them you will inhibit or you will not inhibit your, your subsequent response. And we um, uh, selected regions of interest in the cortical surface, which is where you get the best signal with MEG, and that included dorsal lateral and ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, the frontal eye field, and the intraparietal sulcus. Now we really wanted to identify those regions that show task effects. And what we found was that the intraparietal sulcus and ventral lateral prefrontal cortex did show um, uh, oscillatory activity, but it was equivalent across tasks and equivalent across ages. So I will not talk about these regions. What we did find was that DLPFC and the frontal eye field did show effects of tasks. So here are the results for the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So this is activity emanating from the middle frontal gyrus, the prototypical uh, characterization of DLPFC. And as you can see, we found that there was increased uh, beta band activity during the preparatory period that was specific to anti saccade trials, not to pro saccade trials. And this was evident equally in adults and adolescents. So Again, another piece of evidence that adolescents are using prefrontal cortex in a manner equivalent to adults. This is also by well with past literature showing that in fact, when you are successful at a stop uh, signal test, this is from intracranial recordings, you do find beta activity. Then we found that in the frontal eye field, there was um, that adults and not adolescents showed greater alpha power for anti saccade versus pro saccade trials, which, were, which is what we know reflects inhibitory control. And this goes well with what, has, uh, what we know from animal studies that uh, greater alpha rhythm is indicative of greater, of lower uh, spiking rates. We also found that um, the FEF signal predicts performance. So in adults, trial by trial, alpha band power predicts anti saccade performance, but adolescents did not reach significance. And this we did with a logistic regression because we wanted to see can we predict based, you know, similar to what Doug and uh, Stefan have done. And we were able to do this in adults. Then we looked at connectivity and we found that compared to adolescents, adults showed stronger cross-frequency amplitude coupling between DLPFC beta power and FEF alpha power. So this led us to propose the following, that there might be a threshold way of looking at developmental differences. And what I'm showing you here is you know, a pictorial representation of what we think might be occurring. So that adolescents live in a place where they are still showing greater activity that's not as refined as what we see in adults. And this puts them in a position where they can um, increase their activity that result in inhibitory failure more often than what adults can, but it also allows them to have a lot of correct responses. But it's the best way that we have right now to understand these differences in rate of responses. So in summary, neural mechanisms underlying prefrontal initiation of top-down control of behavior are adult-like by adolescents. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> uh, and that neural mechanisms underlying the generation of inhibitory responses, including integration with prefrontal systems, those are the ones that might still be strengthening through adolescence. 
And thank you to my wonderful lab, to NIMH, and to uh, our MEG uh, Center. Thank you. Anyone wants? All right, a quick question. Yes, no? Yes. Do you have any uh, considerations that the behavior of the adolescents during that preparatory period at some level could be contributing to the variance and in terms of your measures that you correlate that, that in addition to the neural maturation, the ability to sustain attention, motivation, be distracted, or any other behavioral correlates that actually contribute to the variance in that yeah, I, I, that, that's, that's a great um, observation and point, and I think that's exactly what we're trying to say. That, you know, what we're seeing is a neural signature of, you know, immaturities or being close to this threshold of failure might actually be something that reflects these other aspects of behavior, just like you have said, distraction and so forth, so that they could translate to that level. 